That ugly cat is his name Hunter? Baby, let me ask you something. Is you down? Oh, here's Leno. Shot scores. They go into the goal. Leno goes in the middle of the shot. Block the shot. Scores. Matthew Kachuk. What a goal. Back to Matthews. In front. Oh, what a stop by Markstrom. How does that not go? And play continues. Monahan back across. Monchiapani scores on the backhand. What a play as he worked it off his foot. Amor Lucic plays it over. Lucic scores. Comes Monahan. Monahan. Right in. Scores. Sean Monahan in overtime. Like Shillington. Right in. Scores. Oliver Shillington. Here comes Coleman. With a punch of rain. Scores. guys so we're here with tsn's james duffy today how are you james i'm good boys thanks for having me on yeah we, we really appreciate having you on it uh, it means a lot to us it's kind of a childhood dream we've always watched you on sports center every morning so really cool having you on here uh totally uh my pleasure if uh, you guys have gone to the trouble to watch me growing up then uh, <laughs> at least i could do is talk to you on a pod for a while right <laughs> <laughs> no that's awesome that's awesome. I used to. That's, a, that's a one. Uh, one good thing about podcasts. I try to say, try to say yes to as many podcasts as I can because uh, I was like you guys once, you know, starting out. And uh, but it's a uh, it's a cool way to sort of get to know people that you'd never never get to know otherwise, right? So uh, yeah. here we are, old friends yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you want to start I, off? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you just finished covering the Olympics over in Beijing. Um, do you have any, like, what's your all-time favorite Olympic moment? It doesn't have to be hockey-related, just across any sort of sport, really. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be an obvious one. But uh, uh, 2010, when Crosby scored, that was probably, if you would ask me, like, the best moment of my career, I would probably... I've been fortunate enough to do a lot of cool things, but those two weeks in Vancouver were unbelievable. Like I was always a real Olympic geek when I was a kid. I, I love the Olympics. And so what I would do in Vancouver, I was hosting during the day, uh, the whole Olympics, you know, like 12 to six or whatever. And then I would go down and do the hockey games at night from the rink. And so a ton of work, but it was, it was just, the city was just so on fire those two weeks. And where our set was, we had this really cool set that kind of, uh, came out of the stands during the intermission. So we actually sort of sat in the stands and we were probably only six, seven rows up behind the goal where Crosby scored the goal. So uh, to witness that and then to have to go on and talk about it and just be part of that entire broadcast is a tough one to match. Oh, I bet. Um, even as Flames fans, it was a Ginla that set them up with the pass for right. that goal. That, that <laughs> My all-time favorite Olympic moment. Too. I mean, how how old you guys must have been? What like how old are you? Twenty or something like that. We're one. I was so, I was nine, turning ten that year. Yeah. Man, you guys are making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you were old enough to like. That's a memory that'll be. That's probably one of your first like memories, sports-wise, that you knew exactly. We'll always remember exactly where you were, right? Oh, 100%. oh yeah, I know yeah. exactly. Even though I was ten. Uh, <laughs> wow um so yeah you, were were you actually out in Beijing no so because of COVID uh they kept pretty much everybody back here there were very few people in Beijing 
uh, working for the CBC or TSN or whoever. So almost everything you heard, even the play-by-play -play guys. So Chris Cuthbert, and Mike Johnson were doing the play-by-play -play for men's hockey. And they were 20 yards away from me in the studio uh, in downtown Toronto. Oh, so really? That, yeah, that, that sucks because part of the Olympics, I've gotten to cover, I don't know, five or six Olympics. And the Olympics are always a, like a ton of work. You're so exhausted. But being in the city makes it, right? Not just Vancouver, uh, Italy in 2006, London 2012. Uh, being there that that's what is really you know soaking up the, the vibes going to a pub in London or whatever to me that's the coolest part about an Olympic Games and to not experience that takes a lot out of it so and it's tougher for the almost all the play-by-play -play people you heard whether it was you know snowboarding figure skating whatever we're, we're in the building in Toronto it, it makes it which shows how good how good some people are particularly you know I think my guys like Chris Cuthbert and uh and Mike Johnson and then Brian Mudrick and Cheryl Pounder doing the women's games. Yeah, they were watching it off television like the rest of us. So uh, the fact that you guys didn't know that is, a, I think, a compliment to them. Yeah, no, we, we could tell. I would have thought that all you guys were out in Beijing with how mm -hmm. involved into it everyone still seemed. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that. That's, that's really I'd interesting. Actually, I am sort of worried from a broadcasting standpoint that that's the trend, that that's the way that it will go. Uh, because you save so much money and because people like you don't know if you're uh, you know you're some bean counter accountant saying well are we going to spend whatever million dollars to send all these people there we're going to let them just stay back here right so that 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 worries me that that will become even in non-covid times that that will become the norm is that a lot of the broadcasters you will hear will be uh, just in a studio somewhere in, in Toronto wherever it may be which is kind of sad because it's a yeah. lot more fun as a broadcaster to to be at the event live yeah definitely hopefully that doesn't happen because it's not the same if you're not actually in there in the app right if you you know were in the building when you saw that crosby goal like hearing the crowd and feeling the atmosphere inside the building is just a whole nother level to it right yeah i wouldn't have the stories you know half the stories i had from vancouver and i think it's important too to if you are a broadcaster if you're a host of an olympics you know, when you go on the air, you should have experienced some of the things you should have been out in the streets. Right. And uh, so that's, that's a big part of it. Like I said, hopefully it doesn't happen that way, but that's always my fear when people are trying to cut back and cut back these days. Definitely. Makes sense. So shifting from the Olympics uh, over to the world juniors, um, do you have an all time favorite world junior moment? And I mean, this answer could also be obvious if it's what I'm thinking it could be, but <laughs> what, what would your take be on that? Well, you tell me what you think it is, and I'll tell you if you're correct. I won't uh, lie, I promise. <laughs> I'm thinking Everly. Yeah, I think that's it. Because, And there's a, a couple of stories to that. Uh, Ottawa is my hometown. That's where I grew up, and that World Juniors was in Ottawa. So it was very special to me to, uh, you know, to be back there doing it. Uh, it was one of it whether you're from Ottawa or not, it was one of the, uh, it was one of the best world juniors. So I have, I have two dogs that are going to uh, interrupt this interview frequently. <laughs> so this one, I have to, she has to sit behind me while I'm doing these things or she, uh, she gets upset. So sorry about oh. that. Um, oh. That's Willow. <laughs> um, uh, what the heck were we talking about? So the story about that game, which I, I told in one of my books was uh, my parents uh, came to the game and they were getting, uh, what, what is that, 2009 World Juniors or 2008? Uh, so whatever, 12 years ago. So I think my dad was almost 80 and, you know, my mom was probably 75, 76, something like that. And, uh, you know, that arena in Ottawa was way out in the boonies, right, in Canada. Yeah. And mm -hmm. terrible traffic when you leave that rink to get out of there. So the Russians were up with three minutes left. And I could see my dad getting a little bit antsy. So I'm like, right. and I felt, yeah. So I'm like, you guys look at, I think you, you guys should probably leave and beat the traffic. So they're like, okay. So they were in the parking lot, listening on the radio when Everly scored. <laughs> I don't know that they ever <laughs> forgave me for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a rough, that's a rough one as a son. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. Cool. yeah so I felt, I felt really bad, but that was that just, sorry, that whole game. Um, no was and there's so many 
uh, you know, the, the Taves shootout uh, goals, I was back in studio for that. So it's never as special, but that was pretty phenomenal. And even the next year in Saskatoon, which everybody forgets, where Everly scored two goals in the last four minutes to force overtime. And mm-hmm. I often think about, you imagine if, if he had somehow scored in overtime uh, or if, you know, just that Canada had won, the legend of Eberle, which is already unbelievable in junior hockey, would be tenfold if they'd found a way to win that gold medal, right? So, oh, uh, might... yeah, but lot, lots of great moments. Yeah, he might go down as the best world juniors of all, uh, world junior player of all time if they win that game. Um, yeah, I sure. want covering all these world juniors. Um, can you kind of get a feel for which guys have it that are going to make it to that next level and, and which ones don't, or has there been any big surprises that you've seen? That's a great question. And I think I've gotten better at it. I think when I first, you know, because I never played the game at a super high level, I'm just like you guys, right? I don't, I don't think I have, the only extra knowledge I have is from watching games for a lot of years and listening to the guys next to me. I don't pretend to be an expert. I don't pretend to be a great scout. Uh, none of those things. Uh, I'm just basically a, a very lucky fan, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, would, I would always, you know, I'd see a guy at a World Juniors just absolutely dominate and then go, you know, oh, this guy's going to be a star in the National Hockey League. He's a, he's a no-brainer. And then it doesn't work out. I guess the one that would come to mind right off the top of my head would be Justin Pogge, who at the 2006 World Juniors was, you know, he was fantastic. He was the best goalie in the tournament, one of the best goaltending performances ever. He was big. He was poised. He had everything you thought would make a, a great pro goalie. And then it just never happened. And so there's been a, there's certainly been a few guys like that that, you, you know, would dominate a World Juniors but maybe they didn't have a particular style of game for the National Hockey League. And remember back then, it was a lot more physical and size was a bigger thing. So I think maybe that maybe smaller guys that would dominate a world juniors would have trouble in the NHL. I don't think it happens as often anymore just because the game has changed so much and smaller guys have no problem working their way around. Mm-hmm. Um, just trying to think of a guy who, uh, I didn't know until the world. Well, I guess, I mean, Stutzla is not a great exa- example because everybody knew him, but you could just tell, you know, right away from his first world juniors when I think he was 16, that that guy was going to be a good NHL pro. And I still think he hasn't had the greatest start to his career, but I still think he'll be really good. No, definitely. Yeah. Um, speaking of Stutzla in Germany, uh, I also had a question for you about uh, the up and coming uh countries that are getting better like Germany over the last few years we've seen them have a lot more success at the world juniors and really put up tough competition against uh bigger countries I wanted to ask you if there's any other countries that you've heard of or seen that are trending in this yeah that's a tough one uh Germany is the perfect example and that's what we need uh the one thing I think that's been great about the world juniors the last decade Canadian fans might not agree because everybody loved the five straight gold medals but I think it's, it's not great for the tournament if it's just Canada wins every year. And so mm-hmm. the fact that the last 10 years, you know, Finland's won three, the U.S. has won three, Canada's won three, I think has been really, really great for the tournament overall. Uh, but that is still the greatest challenge, you know, more of a challenge in women's hockey, but still a challenge in hockey is to get, you know, basically everyone. It's funny. I do interviews before the World Juniors every year and somebody says to me, who are the favorites? And it's pretty easy because I don't even have to look at the rosters. And I go, well, Canada, the U.S., Russia, Sweden, right. Finland, basically, right? Yeah. So you got yeah. the, those five countries. And, you know, some of them have off years sometimes. Some of them are better than others. But essentially, any of those five can win the gold. And then once in a while, Slovakia will have a really good team. And they'll sneak in and win a bronze. Once in a while, Czechs. Czechs haven't been great of late. But the Czechs will have a good team here and there. Um, mm-hmm. I would say, you know. Slovakia winning uh, the Olymp- this really doesn't tie into the world juniors but Slovakia winning the bronze at the Olympics was awesome I think for the game to have that happen and Denmark won three games at the Olympics now what does that mean anything when most of the guys on Denmark are 28 years old 30 years old and the tournament was weak probably not but Denmark has had a couple of world juniors where they you know they've won games and they weren't even they didn't even play in the first tier tournament forever I think they've only been in it two or three times so now, the last couple of years, Denmark's making it there. Once in a while, they, you know, they have a game where it's only three to one or four to one against the Americans or something. 
right. and so I think Denmark's made some progress, but I'm not sure that Denmark will ever get to the point where we list them amongst those five other countries. Mm -hmm. For sure. No, yeah, that's a, that's a great response. So then in terms of like on the topic of like breakout players and countries, like looking at the NHL right now, are there any current like players that have broken out this season or in past, like even last season that you just didn't see coming? Uh, let me think. I'm, I'm getting old and my memory sucks. So like, I guess, you know, Mo Sider is in the running for the Calder. It's not like nobody saw him coming, but you know, maybe I'd forgotten. There's guys that I forget about. And <laughs> I don't know if you guys are the same. Tell me I'm nope. not old where they get nope. drafted. Right. And they kind of go play for some team like Dallas or something that doesn't get the attention up here that the Canadian teams do. And we just kind of <laughs> forget about them. And then all yep. of a sudden, oh yeah, there's there's that guy again, right? Oh yeah, and, yeah he's in Calder uh, conversation. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So there, there's one where uh, we spend so much time at TSN, you know, focusing on the on the seven Canadian teams. I know the, you guys will probably chuckle and say say, oh yeah, you focus too much on Toronto. We get that all the time. But uh, <laughs> fair fair comment, fair comment. But. Uh, we do like I try to put all my attention or as much as possible on on the seven Canadian teams. And obviously I know what's going on in the rest of the league, but I don't know the players like, a, you know, a scout would know them per se. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there's tons of guys like that that you forget about. And then all of a sudden, holy crap, this guy's a uh, this guy's an up and coming star in the National Hockey League. Right. Yeah. Um, was there any uh, I want to transfer over to the, the women's side of the Olympics. Um, what was it like? I mean, obviously it's huge for Canada to win their fifth gold medal in women's hockey. Um, and I guess I'm asking who would be your tournament MVP, um, from the women's side of things? Uh, geez. I mean, look, Poulain probably wouldn't win it simply because she didn't have like, who was it that, who set the record for points? I know Sarah Nurse had a fantastic tournament um but i'm having a brain cramp here was it melody uh, uh somebody had or did she get hurt <laughs> <laughs> i uh look at the bottom line is like to me poulet i i don't really care about all the earlier games right you can mm -hmm. call you you can rack up 20 points and um and set a record and you'll get the tournament mvp but to me, all that really matters, I mean, you can count the semifinals matters, I guess, but not really. It basically comes mm -hmm. down to the Canada-U.S. games, right? And so exactly. what happens in, in the gold medal game, Marie-Philippe Poulain uh, scores two goals. And I, like I said, I don't want to discount the rest of the tournament because you have to play the games. And, but you know Canada is going to win all those games. So uh, if you, I think you asked anybody in that room who's the MVP, it's, it's MPP, right? She's just... <laughs> When every time you need, I, I think she kind of paced herself in the round robin and said, I'm not going to bother scoring a ton of goals here and racking up the points. I'll just wait until it matters. And that's mm -hmm. what she did. And but, she, uh, I, yeah, so much locker room, like just the, the leader of, of Canada's women's team and has been for a while now. And uh, she, right. she definitely that whole group together. You have to give her the MVP in that room. Right. And, you know, Sarah Fillier is going to be awesome. She's going to probably be the next best player in the world. And uh, Sarah Nurse, I think, was sort of the breakout star where she used to be the last couple of years kind of a depth player on that team. And now, you know, she got a chance in there and, and I think was maybe second in the tournament in points or something. So uh, that's the way I would say. I, I still think Mary Philippe Poulain is the, most, is the best player in women's hockey. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Nurse was the breakout star and, and Sarah Fillier is going to be the superstar to come. Right. Awesome. Right. So objectively from your point of view you know being in Ontario what would your take be on how what the Flames are doing this season because we are a Flames-based channel and all this and yeah kind of interested yeah no that. I mean uh I'm not blowing smoke because you're a Flames podcast I think they are easily the story in in this country the best Canadian chance to win a Stanley Cup um I love everything about that team I'm a huge Daryl Sutter guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. I can tell you if we got a few minutes, I'll tell you a couple of Daryl stories, but uh, I just think he, 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 this is the perfect kind of group for him. 
you know, kind of veteran, uh, veteran laden roster, some, some big guys, some guys who can play physical. You got a great goalie. And that's probably, I probably buried the lead there. The great goalie is the biggest thing. Like, I mean, if someone was to have an argument about, let's say, look at the two best Canadian teams are, are Toronto and Calgary, right? Just record wise. Right. Yeah. So I'm sure there's people in Toronto would have an argument with you, but, and you could argue, okay, Calgary doesn't have, uh, if you were doing a, doing a draft of players, obviously Matthews would go first. Uh, yeah. You guys can argue with me anytime. Marner, Gaudreau, that'd be a tough one, maybe second. Who would you take second? No, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, I'd take Gaudreau second, but. Okay, yeah. that's totally fair. Totally fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could, that would be an, a good argument. Either way, you know, and Kachuk gets in the conversation. So I think Toronto has the best player. Uh, mm-hmm. The roster's fairly equal, probably. But the goaltending, there's not even, like, it's not even. Did you watch the Toronto-Detroit game last? We I don't did. know where you're putting this up. But yeah, Toronto's got some serious problems in net. And you guys have, you know, one of the most rock-solid goalies in the league. And I kind of figured last year would be a problem for him. It's the old sign the big contract, go to the new team. It's like it's almost a hockey cliche that a guy struggles in the first year of his new contract. Yeah, and now did. he looks, he looks on most nights. Awesome. And I've been sort of surprised by their D like how it's not the biggest name defense in, in the NHL, but even watching the game last night, you know, there was a sequence. I didn't stay up for the whole game, by the way, once it was sort of out of hand, I, I usually fall asleep like mid second period. I'm an old guy uh, in the second right. game on, on Saturday nights, but yeah, I think late in the first, there was a se- sequence of three shifts where Zadorov like leveled Boldy and then carried the puck up ice. I can't remember if it was before or after that, created a great scoring chance. And then Shillington's, I think, was on Shillington did like three great things in one shift, the next shift, and then the next shift, Gabranson scored. And I was mm-hmm. like, wow, that's like, that's. <laughs> that's an impressive little sequence there by that unit. Well, always when you have a great goalie, you have guys who can score up front, your D looks better, but I'm just super, super impressed uh, by, I thought Toffoli was the best player that available that you could get to fit into that roster. Mm -hmm. I I just thought that was just such an awesome move for them. So yeah, I think uh, they're Canada's best chance for a Stanley Cup, and you guys have all the reason in the world to be super excited and super pumped about it. Yeah, definitely we are. Um, I, you were talking about the first-year contract as a goalie. Even uh, Markstrom in his first year in Calgary last year, he wasn't anything spectacular. He kind of had. Well, that's an off- what I meant. Yeah, I think I think he was. I think he was just. I don't know. Goalies are weird things, and they. They get, are. I, I just think that he was you know, living up to the expectations and suddenly he was the man on the big contract and uh, first time signing of a huge contract like that. And I think it, I think it sort of got to him and now he's settled in and he's, he's been awesome. So, uh, and if you, if look at in the playoffs with a, with a roster like that, if, if he plays like that, they could do a lot of damage. So um, yeah, they could also go out in the first round. That's the way the world works, but they, they could, they could go deep. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, obviously you've been around broadcasting forever. You've been with Sportsnet forever. Um, so many cool opportunities, but TSN, is there careful the TSN? Sorry, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> what, Can uh, you beep, like, that out? A... beep that out like a swear word? Beep. <laughs> <laughs> what's the, uh, what's the coolest part? Like in day in, day out, what's the, the one thing that just always brings you that happiness, I guess. Uh, well, for me, it's getting to cover big events. One of the, uh, we used to not to get your listeners lost in, uh, I used to do just hockey. Right. And mm-hmm. then whenever we lost the national rights, uh, to Sportsnet, whatever it was years ago, my role at TSN kind of changed where I still do hockey. You don't see me as much cause I do regional leaf games uh which are only in seen in the Ontario region and I do yep. some sense games and uh obviously I still do world juniors and panels and so on and so forth but I also get to do uh the Grey Cup 
Super Bowl, the Masters, Olympics, and things right. like that. Uh, if the Raptors go far, I usually join in with them. And uh, that's, to me, that's, that's what I love is being a part of, you know, big events that matter, a World Junior Gold Medal game or Tiger winning the Masters a few years ago. That's right. where I get my buzz from. And secondarily, just on a day-to-day -day basis, just going in and getting to work with uh, guys I like who are funny and really knowledgeable. And like I said, I think that's my job more than anything else is to be a, you know, somewhat educated fan who can ask the same questions that you guys would want me to ask them, right? And mm -hmm. sit around and watch, watch hockey games with uh, uh, a bunch of really entertaining, entertaining guys. Definitely. And the other thing is just to, to meet, uh, you know, to, to get to meet people in the game. I'll tell you the Daryl stuff now. Um, so Daryl used to scare the hell out of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I would only I would only see him at the draft usually. This okay. was uh, in in his first go around with the Flames, and then maybe the beginning early years with the Kings. And uh, usually, I would always be up on the stage. TSN used to do the draft, and when a guy got drafted in the first round, he would come over with the general manager and and sit next to me, and we do a little interview. And Daryl would always be there, and Daryl like was tough, right? He was yeah. tough to interview, and. He'd give me like one word answers and look like he wanted to kill me the whole interview. And then he'd always like shake. We get up after where the interview was done and we we're off air to shake my hand. And uh, he would like shake my hand so hard. I felt like he was like breaking my hand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just a sutter handshake. I've realized now, but at the time I thought there was a little extra there. And so I was, I was somewhat intimidated by the guy always, but always respected him. And, I don't know if you guys would know this. You're probably too young, but if you're uh, when you're when you're done, did you ever see something we did on YouTube called the Panel Hangover? Probably you're probably too young for it because it's probably about eight years ago. So do me a favor and uh, spend four minutes. Go on YouTube and just Google the the Panel Hangover. So basically, <laughs> after the Kings won their first Stanley Cup. Um, it's a long story, but one of the guys you guys have seen the Hangover, obviously, right? Yeah, the movie. Yeah. So <laughs> the guy, the Zach Galifianakis uh, character, there's a guy in my work who looked exactly like him. Oh, okay. And so we were talking about we were talking about doing a story on the on the King Stanley Cup Hangover, and I got this idea to do a parody of the Hangover, uh, where we went to L.A. and basically got messed up, and uh, one of our panelists, who was Aaron Ward at the time, got got lost, just like this, just like the Hangover just like story. The movie. Yeah. 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 So we, I wrote this entire script, which involved the Kings and Kopitar was one of the stars and everything. And um, I needed an ending. And the ending was like, who, who spiked our drinks, right? <laughs> and so I, and I, could, I couldn't figure out who to do it. And then it came to me, I said, it's gotta be Daryl. But I had, I wrote, so I wrote this letter to like the Kings PR, this email. And I tried to explain the story. You try to explain that story on an email. It's like, yeah, I'm doing a parody of the hangover. And we're going to come to L.A. and pretend that we got all messed up. And uh, uh, I want it to be Daryl who spiked my drink. So I got to do a scene with Daryl where he comes in. It's like I said, I said, we have no chance, no chance of this happening. Right. And then a couple of days later, the PR guy writes back and goes, yeah, Daryl's going to do it. I, I couldn't believe it. And he did it and did it perfectly. And uh, so we got to be friends. And after they won their second cup, I went back and did the story on Daryl and, uh, we just did an interview at his house. And then when it was done, he said, what are you guys doing now? And I said, I don't know. We're just going to go back to our hotel. we got a flight in the morning. And he said, Oh, let's go out for dinner. So he took the whole crew out for dinner and like these, you know, sound guys and, and, and uh, uh, audio guys and stuff that I don't even think knew hockey. We just hired them in LA and, <laughs> and we could not get out of that bar like till like two in the morning. Oh, talking wow. hockey talking hockey with this guy and i'm finally like daryl man i gotta go i gotta catch a flight in like four hours <laughs> but i just i think people you know people who just judge him by the gruff news conferences you know where he doesn't give answers he's a he's a really solid guy and I, I i respect the hell out of him as a coach and i think as i said i'm now the perfect guy with that roster in calgary definitely Oh yeah, that's the panel awesome. hangover. Give it five minutes after you're done with me, okay? Yeah, definitely will. <laughs> will do. I'm actually going to take a note of that right now. <laughs> <laughs> we used to do. Uh, 
again, you guys would have been too young because I haven't done them many in years. But one of the fun things, going back to your other question, is uh, TSN lets us be really stupid sometimes. And right. uh, I really like that. When Luongo was playing, I'm pretty good buddies with him. We did a whole bunch of, uh, you can go down a rabbit hole on YouTube with stuff we did with Luongo. Really, really dumb features. Um, and we did a couple of videos, really stupid. Uh, we had a song called uh, Puck Over Glass that we wrote during one year when all the puck over, and we made a video for it. You can look up that. And there's a cheesier one called Don't Take My Goal Away, which we did like a Backstreet Boys video with Jeff O'Neill. <laughs> Jeff O'Neill and Marty Biron and Jamie McLennan and I, we did like a, I wrote a, I, I dabble in writing songs on the side and I have a musician, I work with named Lester and, so I, I write the song and he puts it to music and we, we do these dumbass videos. Don't take my goal away was basically when I was frustrated with video reviews and oh. uh, how long they were taking and everything. And so we did yeah. a, uh, so there's another five minutes for you if you're bored. Uh, don't take my goal away on, uh, on YouTube. Really, really dumb uh, Backstreet Boys type video. I think I remember seeing a couple of those uh, Luongo. I'm not sure if they were commercials or snippets or whatever. No, but yeah, just snippets, always... just little bits. Yeah, really. But that's yeah. fun, right? Like, I, I always think of sports. And the reason I got in, not to get heavy with you, but I used to be a news reporter and uh, covered fires and murders and everything. And I, I didn't like that. It was such a negative world. And I can remember the my boss back in the, that time, I was only, you know, 24, 25 years old. And he's like, you should focus on, you know, being a war correspondent in the Middle East or whatever. And I just, I didn't see my life that way. I, I love sports and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just too much of a positive person to be involved in negativity all the time. And yeah. so sports, you know, you can be serious as fans. Like you guys can be completely passionate fans and yell at your TV screen and, cry when your team gets knocked out all that's great but you got to remember that sports is an escape right and it so is. when we get to do silly stuff like that i think it's just to remind people that it's an escape and it should be fun definitely 100 i have a message on the zoom saying that it'll be up in about it'll be like the meeting will end automatically in about six minutes so we should probably okay. start wrapping it up here that was actually pretty yeah no worries that was a pretty deep way to end the episode. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, boys. Uh, is there one last story that you could tell us from uh, anybody on the Flames roster, a guy like Lucic or uh, or any anyone really? <laughs> oh, okay, let me let me think now. Now you're gonna put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Luch, Luch, I know really well. Uh, I just don't know if I have any like crazy, crazy ass stories with Luch. Uh, Let's see. No, Luch, I mean, the only really thing I have with Luch is that I was the first one that knew when he was signing with uh, the Oilers because we were doing free agency day. And uh, I know him well and was texting back and forth with him and said, uh, what's it going to be, bud? And he said, I'm playing with the best player in the world. And uh, that's when uh, that's when I knew he was uh, going to Edmonton. But uh Another guy I just like, I think he's a, you know, you got dragged through the mud a little bit because you signed such a big contract. And I, I here's the one thing and I'll leave you with this is that I think we get too caught up in fans in like hating a guy because of his contract. For like sure. if, you know, if you're Milan Lucic or, uh, you know, whoever it may be, I'm trying to think of a good example now of a guy who's got a big deal. who's not worth the deal. Uh, uh, Wilson down in San Jose. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bobrovsky, when he first signed in Florida there at the beginning, same right. sort of deal with first year as a free agent sucked. But you cannot, I don't think you can ever resent the player, right? If it was the, any of the three of us, someone's offering you a, a truckload of money, you're, you're going to say yes to that money. Oh, 100%. And, and so you're, now you get in the mindset that it's hurting your team that this guy's making so much money, so it's his fault. Well, it's not his fault. He was paid what the market at the time gave him to pay. And if he's not living up to it, you're frustrated. And I'm sure he's super frustrated because he wants to live up to it. But mm -hmm. I just don't think there should be hate for guys like that, right? It's, uh, you know, you're, you can hate your GM who maybe made, made a mistake in the signing. But yeah. I, don't think it should be, I don't think it should be taken out on the player. Uh, nope. Because... 
good on them for making whatever they can. Hockey careers are short. And if you can get your payday, I think you got to take full advantage of it. Definitely. And I think Flames fans uh, have been really good with that. You know, every time he touches the puck in the Saddle Dome, everybody's chanting his name. Um, like, we love him here in Calgary. And he, he brings such a good aspect to this team. So, Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. The only other one I have, I just remember Good Branson was on the team that lost the World Juniors in, uh, in Buffalo. Uh, that time, they, the Russians scored five straight goals in the third period when yep. Canada was up three to nothing. And I was walking down uh, after the game, uh, down underneath where the players are, and he came out of the locker room. And I, I knew him a little bit because yeah, he's from Ottawa. And so I got to know him when the year he was drafted, which I guess was that year, the year before. And, and I just remember his eyes and he just looked at me and said, what the just yep. happened. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. Just the absolute, uh, man, I was so just so hurt for all that team. Like I, and I, whether it's Canada or somebody else, that's just a crushing way to lose. And he was just so in shock that the team had fallen apart uh, that I'll, 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 I'll never forget that. So I hope the guy gets to win a Stanley cup somewhere along the way, maybe in hopefully. Calgary. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All righty. So we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you, James. This was awesome. Yeah. No, no problem right. boys. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, like I said, if, uh, it's always good to uh, help out young guys doing broadcasts. So uh, hope you guys kick ass and uh, are number one on uh, iTunes someday, or you get Joe Rogan money on Shopify someday. <laughs> awesome! Thank you so much. Shop James. Shopify, Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> I had to save my one old guy comment to the end. Of course, you know, yep. that, you know that Shopify where they get the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right, have a good one, boys. Take it easy. Yes, thank, thank you. you thank you. All right. Talk to you later. That was the best video we've recorded. Yeah, by far. My God, dude. Like I am, I am so like, whew, that was amazing. We fucking killed it. So, um, if you like our content, feel free to like <laughs> subscribe, listen everywhere. And, uh, we're going to go process what just happened. Thank you for listening. Thank you, everybody. Holy.